Welcome to Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. I almost forgot to say who I was. Yes. I was waiting for you to say you're Kevin, but you can't do that unless I introduce myself first, right? Usually. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Usually. So we are continuing our series in hermeneutics. Last time I said Christology. (laughs) Nope. Hermeneutics, which is actually all about Christology. So as, as I learned last time, I didn't actually mess up. Right. So anyways, we talked about the most important verse in the Old Testament. Now we're going to talk about other important verses in the Old Testament, but not the most important. It's kind of dangerous qualifying verses like that, isn't it, Kevin? We'll, we'll just let God reveal himself in his word and yeah. not tell him when he's doing a good job and when he's not. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yet we're still going to name that last title the, the most important verse yes. in the Old Testament because that's, that's better clickbait. It is better. So we're going to talk about Psalm 13 because one of my questions that I've had as we've been going through this hermeneutic series, we talked about it last week or last episode, which was not last week. We're not going to talk about how long it was it's since that actually got recorded. Um, how, how do you see Jesus in the Old Testament, especially when it's maybe not quite so obvious? How do you read the Old Testament Christologically? If we're going to apply the, the hermeneutic principles that we've been talking about that are the core of this series, how do we do that in the Old Testament in places where it might be a little harder to see Jesus? So, Psalm 13, Kevin, take it away. Psalm 13. We are reading from the English Standard Version. And the Hebrew does include the inscription above the psalm. So, normally you don't read subtitles without part of the text. But in the Psalms, the little dedication that says a psalm of David or whatever actually is part of the psalm. So, Mm -hmm. we'll read it. So, this one begins, To the choir master, a psalm of David. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Thus ends the reading. Thus far the text. Oh, right. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So one of the things to remember as you're reading the Psalms is that a lot of them do have headings. And a lot of times it'll tell you that it's a Psalm of David and According to the New Testament, we would like to refer to these psalms as being the psalms that David wrote. Um, This isn't always overly apparent whether he's the author or they're dedicated to him since he was a king or he was whatever role he had in the production of the psalm. But this seems to be one that David himself did write. And so when we say a psalm of David, we would read this to be a psalm that David wrote. Um, Otherwise, to read of would be for David or regarding david but so to the choir master is like hey i wrote this psalm right set this to music we're gonna sing we're this. gonna sing it in church okay okay so david so, david the cantor exactly nice and so this is a psalm of david and um if you if you read the church fathers who talk about this psalm and, and kind of the history of interpretation many people will take this as a psalm of david um after his sin with Bathsheba, and he has now um kind of dealt with the reality of his sin and is now examining the implications of his sin, which is separation from God. And he's in despair, which is the state of being um, terrified that God is not with you anymore. And he's he's kind of working through that as he um, considers the true implications of the full nature of his sinfulness. And what that means for his standing before God. Now, so, isn't Psalm 51 also one from after Bathsheba? So Psalm 51 is kind of the one we all know as he's looking back on Nathan's accusation of him that he is the man who who did this that Nathan was accusing. Okay. And he's confessing. His, that's kind of a psalm of confession ah, of the actual sin okay. as he works through 
Um, against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Uh, Create me a uh, clean heart, O God. Those kind of things. So, so this is the further working out of well, further that, or that whatever it is. Or <laughs> yeah, it's maybe a different look at things, which is um, the the implications of my sin is that I'm separated from God. Okay. Or afraid that I might be separated from God, which is a very a very important thing. Um, for us to remember as we read this psalm together. So um, right away, the first thing we want to do when we read psalms is to remember that they were written in the Old Testament times. Now that sounds strange. Obviously, it's in the Old Testament. It would make sense that it was written in the Old Testament times. <laughs> but a lot of people read the psalms and they want to make the first move of, this describes what I'm going through now. Hmm. Which, let's be honest, that's the attraction of the book of psalms is that you can often open the book of Psalms, kind of page through a little bit, and find something that expresses... I, I can relate to this situation. Yeah, I can relate like, to these feelings, these emotions. I can relate to these words. I'm just going to take them and say them as if I'm the one first saying them. And and that's that's easy to do because a lot of the Psalms you say, yeah, that's, that's putting words to what I'm thinking or feeling or mm-hmm. experiencing spiritually or I'm going through a rough patch and... This psalm actually says it. it it's so, one of it's kind of how we appreciate poetry in many right. ways, or, and why we appreciate poetry. And so we do, we do that with the psalms. So, and that's certainly something we don't want to stop anybody from doing. That's that's a good thing to turn to the Word of God to find expression for what we're going through and to help us um, understand how to how to kind of deal with with life and both the good and the bad you have psalms that are explicit praise and almost effusive praise right you just can't stop mm-hmm. saying hallelujah you just go over and over yep. and over well sometimes those psalms resonate right you just <laughs> life is good and you just kind of want to praise god and yeah when you talk about pray praying the psalms mm-hmm. or singing the psalms i mean yeah that's what we're it's doing good. that's what we're doing yep. and you think especially when you go to worship and the pastor pronounces absolution i mean what are you going to do it's just this is great. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I walked in here with death and I was given life for free. This is great. Hallelujah. I mean, what else are you going to say? And the other time we think about, you know, Psalms really expressing our feelings is you, you wake up Easter morning mm. and you, you literally greet each other with hallelujah. Right. Yeah. You, yep. You're actually looking each other and saying, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. This is, th- there's nothing left but to praise God. He has done it all. And it all it is all marvelous in our sight. It is all for our benefit. And so we with the psalmist just kind of walk around saying, Everything praise God. This is great. This is just <laughs> hallelujahs all day long. But but much more of our life is actually kind of in the middle. It's not total despair. It's not effusive hallelujahs. Mm-hmm. It's kind of something else. And and what we they find in the Psalms is kind of a very honest book. A bunch of 150 of them of these poems prayers um, maybe um, exclamations songs however you want to label them but but they're things that we read through and if, if you read it long enough you kind of ended up nodding your head yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah yeah. that's kind of what i'm or or i've been through i've been there you know yeah. i've i've felt this I've, so so i've prayed this praying the psalms singing the psalms relating them to us can be a good thing to do, a very helpful thing. Very good. But you were saying that's not the first move necessarily. But as, as we do that, we don't want to think that this is something that, that is simply about me and my day. But the fact this is written by King David actually means something as well. So what we want to understand in the Psalms is that these are written by other believers as they experience life in faith. These are not just generic words that we kind of go, yeah, that relates to me. I can kind of make that my own. But we actually read a psalm and we say, okay, here's King David, the messianic king, the king against which all other kings are compared, the one who is in himself a very prophecy of the Messiah. His son will be the Messiah over and over, especially in 2 Samuel chapter 7. When, when Israel wants to talk about when we had it good, we talk about when David was king, mm-hmm. right? That's yep. who wrote this. So we read it understanding that, but we also read it understanding that David, just like us, was a sinner. Mm-hmm. So one of the things we also read in the Psalms is that this 
this finds expression in my life not just because I'm an up a person and is written by a person, but more importantly, these are the people of God. And this is part of the salvation history of our God that he worked through his people Israel. And so as you read the Old Testament, we're reading the story of God saving his people, God's gracious action to save his people. Now there's law in there because his people sin, mm -hmm. but there's also a lot of grace where God graciously saves his people. He's full of steadfast love, right? He's abounding in steadfast love. He rejoices to forgive sins, all these kind of things. Well, here's what we have in David now. We have David who has sinned and is feeling the effects of the law mm -hmm. and he's crying out, how long, O oh Lord? Are you gonna forgive me forever? Is this it? Is this it? I, I'm yeah. sinned and I'm done? You're, I'm just done with you and you're done with me? Well, he can't live with that. Right? Yeah. I mean, just look at this psalm. He can't live with that. <laughs> he doesn't say, are you going to hide your face from me? Fine, I'll go on and do something else. He doesn't say that. I mean, this is terrible. How long was it he counsel of my soul and have sorrow? The result of God not being present in David's life or the fear of God not being present is sorrow. Mm. And this drives us. This drives us in repentance to the one whose presence we need. And with David, we say, if my sin separates me from you, I'm toast. Mm -hmm. I got nothing, right? And so we cry out with David, consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep in the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. And here's the question. Why would God listen to a sinner's prayer? And this is what drives us to a Christological understanding of the psalm. Is that the one who cried out to God from the cross is the one who invites us to pray to his Father in his name and promises to always intercede for us before the throne of grace. And as 1 Timothy chapter 2 says, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And so as we, as we join David in this psalm, we say, these words make sense to me. When the law convicts me of my sin, when life beats me down and I'm tempted to not see God in my life, to wonder if he's gone and to come face to face with reality that if God is gone, that I have no hope, then I am brought to the very foot of the cross of Jesus Christ, where the presence of God is not in triumph and glory, but the presence of God is veiled in the cross of Christ. Mm -hmm. And here with David, we are not afraid to cry out, how long, O Lord? I, I don't see you. I don't feel you. I can't perceive your presence. And if you are gone, the enemy triumphs and I sleep in death. So I don't remember, I don't remember if I've talked about this on the podcast before, because I don't remember how many times we've discussed Psalms. <laughs> but one of the things that helps me read a Psalm like this Christologically is actually a particular phrase. And I can't remember who taught it to me, but it, it's been years since somebody taught me this. <clears throat> but whenever you're reading the Psalms, <clears throat> excuse me, and you see the phrase steadfast love, I've learned to ask, I've been taught to ask, where does God show his steadfast love. Where do we actually see that happening? And for us, it's it's easy. We see that in Christ. That is the ultimate expression of his steadfast love is in the crucifixion, the life, death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus, the Christ event as we've talked about here. David doesn't see that event, but he does have the promise of that event. He does the he has God's steadfast love. He has been shown God's steadfast love. For example, the last episode, and I'm talking about Exodus and where God reveals who he is, where he saves his people. He, he has these examples of God's steadfast love in his life. So when, I, when I'm reading a psalm and I'm trying to figure out where is Jesus, well, that's, that's an easy dead giveaway, which in this case, going backwards then back into the psalm, you can see how David can express this as how long, knowing there's an end to it, 
you know, this isn't going to go on forever because that's not who God has shown himself to be. He has not revealed himself as a God where, sorry, this is forever. There's no fixing this. There's no forgiving this. That's It's all over for you. Therefore, David prays, how long? Knowing the character of God, the character of the, of the one that he worships, that he trusts in, in spite of, as you've said, his sin. And we've discussed in this case what that particular sin is. Murder, adultery. We've got a long list of things here that's like, uh-oh. This, that's, that's about as bad as you can get for, for a human sinner right there. Um, but he knows the character of his God. He knows who God is. And so he can actually say steadfast love. He can actually say how long. We, we also know that. We've also been shown that same character, that same promise. We've actually seen it fulfilled. We're after the, the fulfillment of that. So for me, that's that's been a very helpful tool in reading the Psalms in particular. Just, I, I remember listening to a chapel message one time years ago where, where the speaker was speaking on a Psalm and they read the Psalm and, you know, they're Lutheran. So like, let's do a law gospel sermon on this. And they said, well, I found a lot of law. Uh couldn't really find any gospel, so the end. I'm like, no, 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 the steadfast love. Did you did you see that phrase is in here a couple times? There's Jesus. He's right there. And so I know that this can be a helpful tool, and not everybody knows this. Right. And then it's like, there it was, right there. Um, and like I, I didn't like get up and shout that, but it was like, oh, he could have used that. That just, It's so simple. It's, it's right there. So... That's, that's, I found that to be helpful in reading Psalms Christologically. Where I get into trouble is if the Psalm doesn't have that in there, it's like, uh-oh, now I don't have my easy out. Because right. not every Psalm has the not every psalm steadfast has love phrase in it. <laughs> but, but I think one thing that, that we also want to talk about, that's exactly right. I agree with what you said. That's, and that's obviously the, the easiest and the most explicit Christological move in the Psalms. Is mm-hmm. it, it literally says, God loves us eternally, kind of, well... First John chapter four, you know, and this is love. Not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for us. You sins. had to make it about John, so didn't you? It's always about John. You, uh. So, but I'm actually going to go a different place because <laughs> one of the things that I want to, I want to make sure we highlight in this Psalm is, and, and this is just a wonderful insight. Um, Dr. Seleska, who teaches at Concordia Seminary, St. Louis, this is just a wonderful insight that he he brings to the reading of the Old Testament is that it really is about death and resurrection. Hmm. And I think this is something we skip. But look at Psalm 13 and think about death and resurrection. So it starts with death. Right? How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? I mean, this is the talk of death. You're forgotten. Will you hide your face from me? Your soul and your heart. I mean, yeah, these yeah, are I mean, deep just, in your being. It's just, it's literally excruciating, right? And it's, and I, I will sleep in the sleep of death finally. Mm. But then the turn. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation, right? See, steadfast love and salvation, these are eternal things that have to do with being resurrected. Mm. He's put to death in his sins but he's resurrected in the Lord's steadfast love. And this is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our sins are crucified with him and we are joined with him in his resurrection. And so we come before God with the psalmist, with David, and we too cry out, how long, O Lord? When I look at my, look at the psalm, look at verse two, must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart? Well, when you look inside yourself, what do you see? <laughs> oh, boy. Not yeah. good. Then now yeah. we're confessing our sins. I, yep. a poor, miserable sinner. Yep. Right? But then turn and look. But I, I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. Well, we'll go back to put verse one and verse two together when you've been abandoned by god mm-hmm. all you've got left is yourself right and that's the only place you got to look yeah it's like oh so that's not yeah <laughs> so now well now we read this and i'm going to say let's read this in light of galatians chapter 2 verse 20 
for I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, hmm. but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Doesn't that sound a lot like, but I have trusted in your steadfast love? Mm -hmm. See, when I look at me, ugh, not good, right? Yeah. This is not good. And, and God should abandon me according to my qualifications for all this, right? Yep. I do not deserve his love. I should not be in his presence. My sins have removed me from his presence. And when I look at my soul, when I look in my heart, I've got sorrow. I've got fear. As a matter of fact, I've got death. Well, you, you should. But Kevin, right now, the culture is telling me very strongly, I need to look in my heart to find the way. Right. That I need to follow my heart, that I need to trust myself. I, I've... I've I've always noticed this. I mean, it's always kind of been there, your Disney movies and everything. But I think in some ways it's becoming even more explicit. Um, Superman is somebody that I think of. There's various Superman shows and movies out there right now. All of them have Superman finding his own moral compass inside himself. And there's explicit lines saying you just need to trust yourself. Trust what's inside you and you'll know what to do. You'll know how to do what's right and moral. Uh, and there's plenty of other examples. That's just the one that comes to mind yeah. right now that I'm currently watching things with him in it. Maybe uh, you should stop. Or I should have definitely <laughs> not followed that advice. Right. Just don't yeah, listen to that part. Either way. Um, both but, are options. But that's a very good point. And one of the things that we do learn from the Psalms is that our attention is always turned back to God. Um, the longing to be where God is is one of the most amazing things in the Psalms is that sometimes you can say in the Psalms a person is either rejoicing to be in the house of the Lord or wants to get there. Mm. Yeah, They're either glad they're in Jerusalem or they want to get back Yep, because that's where God is and where God is is grace and mercy and forgiveness. Now look at David. He's longing to be back in the presence of the Lord because he's afraid he's lost it. But when he gets back to God, what does he see? I have trusted in your steadfast love right in your salvation he has dealt bountifully with me and and as we began the this little episode talking the psalms also teach us to sing and why because he has dealt bountifully with me mm -hmm. our praises are not just because god is good or god is big or you know i awesome. found or awesome <laughs> or or even hey i found someone to commiserate with me i found a psalm that commiserates with me this is great i too struggle with things oh yeah i'm like david mm -hmm. no that's actually not the point <laughs> the point is the steadfast love of the lord the 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 point is that the lord has dealt bountifully with us and the question is well what has god done that i would trust in him yeah. And the answer is Jesus. When you want to know who God is, you look at the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and you say, God for me, because he died for sinners and I'm a sinner. So he invites all of us to hear the gospel as this is God loving the world, loving you, forgiving your sins. Believe that. Trust in that. And you know what happens when you do? All of a sudden, you're doing exactly what Paul says to the churches in both Ephesians and Colossians. Because of God's love, guess what you do? You speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Kind of sound like Psalm 13, verse 6, <laughs> right? I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. And what we have in the psalms is, is also the encouragement that, yeah, life is hard, sin stinks and will kill you and we come before god with total honesty we come before one another with honesty mm -hmm. we say i'm going through a rough patch my sin is killing me right i'm going through this yes let's pray the psalm together but let's not revel in our sins not let's not revel in our misery let's turn to the cross of jesus christ and there see that god or wallow in it or wallow in it yeah either way <laughs> but but we don't we don't want to just revel in this and say this is awesome i feel bad but we actually want to turn and say, let's get to where God has dealt with our sin. Mm -hmm. And when he deals with our sins, he pours out all of his wrath on his son. And he says, now I'm going to deal bountifully with you, sinner. And the, the bounty that he gives to us is his grace and his mercy and his steadfast love. And listen to this. Jesus says in John, 
he says this to his disciples. He says, because I live, you too will live. Mm. And that's a reason to sing. And that's the crucial conversation. This is, this is the human experience, but we don't stop at the human experience. We move towards Christ and look to him. And hopefully in our series on Christology, that's what hermeneutics did it again. Same thing. It's, it's, it's all the same thing. That's what we're helping you guys do. Hopefully you continue on with us in this journey. We're going to keep going through scripture passages and doing this. Uh, a couple more episodes that way, and then we're going to start dealing with some topics and themes and how we do this in the world around us. So thanks for joining us, and we'll see you guys next time. See ya.